Today we're going to take a look at how to approach color refractive materials and materials with evolving tint over different densities. We'll look at spectral analysis of yellow food dye to understand the physics behind its behaviors. We'll take a look at V-Ray Farm, but this video applies to every path tracer available. So even if you're on cycles, karma, all known, whatever, feel free to stick around. Right, so if we look at some references, uh, we really see these materials quite a lot in our everyday life. Uh, traffic lights are an example, brake lights also, foot dyes and even water. And you can notice how the color changes over density and depth of some of the materials. If you take a look at foot dyes, nearly all of them are black, but of course they're not when used. All objects we see absorb some of the light they receive and reflect the opposite. If you put them through a spectrophotometer, you can see how exactly they absorb each wavelength of light, and subsequently, each color they remove from light waves any time it passes through it. In the case of materials, like foot dye and water, this absorption curve is varied and gradual, and the color we perceive contains a wide variety of wavelengths that add up to be interpreted as a single color. So when you add up multiple drops of dye, you essentially repeat that absorption operation, which reveals new colors, and in all case, red. So the way VeraFog works is very simple. It's only multiplying the color you choose at every iteration of the depths you choose. So in this example, I have a 5 cm thick plane and 5 1 cm thick planes. And we can see that the results on both sides are exactly the same. If you want a more visual explanation, since I have 5 1 cm thick planes, the attenuation is happening 5 times. And this principle is universal, it happens in every refractive material. And this phenomenon is part of what happens in water with cyan. It also happens in tea with orange and in all kinds of material. And the entire game with fog is to actually find the relationship between the right fog color and the right depth, which can have vastly different effects. And so, because the fog's multiplication is just absorption, watch what happens if I take a fully luminous and fully saturated color. It completely breaks, there is no attenuation anymore. It's fully bright, even after many rounds of multiplication, and it will keep on doing so even if I add even more iterations of it. But why is that? Well, remember what we've said about absorption. Every single iteration of multiplication removes some of the default color we've chosen. But if you don't have at least a little bit of darkness in it, it doesn't have anything to remove, it only multiplies the same pure color. Because of that, if we remove just a little bit of brightness and reduce the luminance to 0.95, our shader starts to work again. It's still not perfect, now the problem is saturation. If you only have one color, it doesn't have any other color to work with. The thing is, in nature, there isn't any material that only absorb one wavelength at one intensity. Instead, in real life, we would have a smoother curve that interacts with all other colors as well. And for that, we need to reduce the saturation just a little bit as well. Removing saturation is adding a little bit of white, and adding a little bit of white is adding a little bit of every other color for our material to work with. Now if we want to see the tint variation that we see in some materials like water or tail lights, we have to choose an in-between color. You see, if we only choose a primary color, we don't have any other color mixed in except for the little bit of white we've added. Right now, our material still primarily absorbs red, but if we choose an in-between color, we can start widening the curve and introducing other kinds of behaviors because it now absorbs other tints at other intensities. Now I may have gone a little bit too far into oranges, it's not really red anymore. There we go, now my hue is a little bit more relevant, and we can start seeing some salmon and oranges before we get our red. So all of these intricacies and traps are things to be mindful of at all times when working with V-Ray fog and any other kind of fog really. Okay, so before anything, I wanted to show you a little bit of every technique I've seen online to create this kind of effect and discuss some of their limitation compared to the colored fog technique. So the first technique I'd like to discuss, and a more limited one, would be to color the refraction. The issue with this technique is that refract color acts as an upper limit to any light going through it. Regardless of the light behind, it will always range between black and refract color. So through the glass, you'll never get any other tint than the one you've chosen in the refract color, regardless of the light behind. Now, as you can see, when I decrease or increase the intensity of the light, it's never changing in color. And I actually have to go to insane intensities to actually have a little bit of white inside. The second technique would be to show the diffuse color by making the refraction less than white 
and actually coloring the light that's inside so the light here is actually yellow as opposed to white. And this technique isn't all bad, it happens in real life so it's physically accurate, some materials are not fully refractive and you can always color your lights inside. But the problem with this technique is that you don't really have any interest in the diffuse and the color that you show within the light is always the same, it's always the same tint of yellow. There is no transition from bright yellow to orange to deep red. Another limitation with this technique is that because you see diffuse color, you actually have light and shadow onto it, so if I increase the light intensity, you can see that the diffuse color is getting some interaction here. And this is where the colored fog shader comes into play. We have every effect that we're looking for. We have the deep red inside the acrylic, we have the orange in the transition, and we have the yellow at the core of the light. If I start rotating, we see even more differences, and a good side effect of the colored fog is that we do have this attenuation of light when we see it at an angle. You see, because when we see this mesh at an angle, we actually have more acrylic between the light and our eye. So there's actually more iterations of depth happening between us. And this is why, along with, of course, the light intensity and light directionality, we sometimes see view-dependent variations in car lights. So here I have this little scene I've arranged with a little car from Wire Wheels Club that I recommend. If I turn off the color class, we can see I have some lights behind prepared. And I also have some of the shaders I've seen online that we can test on our setup. So in the first setup, where the refraction is colored, we can see the problems we've previously mentioned. If I turn off every lens effect, we can see that the colors really have issues here. If I turn on sRGB really quick, we can see the problems are even more glaring. The second shader with the visible diffuse color is a little bit more correct. It's not the right light colors, but we really could just uh, color the lights like this. Now we can see it's a little bit better but it still suffers from the other problems that we do not wish to have here. We have quite large differences uh, between the glass and the actual light that we can clearly see in some spots. We don't have a wide variety of tinting. Here it kind of is the case because I've cranked down the refraction glossiness to allow for merging between the diffuse color and the light color. But in some other spots like here or here, the colors are much more linearly yellow. Now we can instead use the Virifog method. So, first off, I'll make the diffuse all black to make sure I have absolutely nothing showing up. Obviously we'll make the reflection white, use the glossiness just a little bit. I'll turn on refraction, now we can see that our lights appear. Obviously they're fully white because there's no color inside. I'll go into my fog color, set both the saturation and the luminance to 0.95. Then I'll select a hue I like, I think I'm gonna take this yellow. And obviously I'm going to crank down the depth to add iterations after iterations of multiplication. Now just for good measure I'll reduce the refraction glossiness just a little bit to merge the colors together. And there we have it, car backlights showing every feature from the references we can see. Here I have this little scene prepared with the beach, which is nothing complicated. The process is essentially the same and we can take a look from afar and see how the colors change. Now the tricky thing with water is that you can see the larger bodies of water are almost pure black, it's only reflection, and that is not accurate. Now you could reduce the refract and show a little bit of the diffuse color, but that method clashes with the lighting, it creates shadow issues where you can see shadows of objects onto the surface, it also doesn't work really well at different angles. When you have reflections like this, it can be hidden, but when you don't, your body of water just looks fake. And the reason for this is that in the case of water and other scattering materials, fog is not the perfect solution. It's only an approximation of one part of the equation. And properly depicting this kind of behavior in V-Ray can be a lot trickier. And the solution for this kind of shader, and this is not a topic for this video because it could be an entire tutorial in and of itself, is to actually use scattering shader that treats its object as volume. Water actually scatters shorter wavelengths, so you see it blue but at different depths the color changes and you have color shifts inside. Some of the bounces bounce back into our eyes above the surface and it looks blue as diffuse. But let's get back to our approximation shader. And a water shader using fog is actually quite simple. You just add your reflection, keep the glossiness at 1, Reduce the IRR to 1.33. Obviously you add refraction. You can reduce the refraction glossiness just a little bit. And last but not least, you're gonna add turquoise for color. Now a good technique to know if the color of your water is accurate and not too much on the right side, too much on the left side. 
You can just put all the settings to maximum to make a technical render if you want. And the hue you select should come off as blue. You can reduce the depth centimeter to make sure you see your actual fog color at its maximum. And the color you choose should come off as blue. If it comes off as green, you've gone too far into the green tints. So what I'll do here is that I'll stay just above the green limit. I'll reduce the value to 250. And also the saturation to 250. And the problem you can see of course is that the depth is way too small. If we increase it, it's still too big. You should not be afraid to go into high depth either. Sometimes the scales of your scene require it. And I'll put a depth of 10 centimeters to have the intensity I like. But now what I can see is that it's way too saturated. And nothing in Fog says that you have to be towards the maximum of saturation or value. If you want, you could totally go into low saturations. And that's exactly what we want for water. And there you have it, your own water shader. So similar to water, Blood is a special material because there is actually scattering happening inside. You have multiple components into blood and plasma is actually just a yellow refractive liquid. But blood itself is also scattering light. So similar to water, just going to be scattering happening inside and some of it coming back into our eye. So it has this kind of SSS look to it. And this mix of multiple materials and multiple behaviors is what gives this kind of yellow tinting when blood gets very thin. It's a little bit subtle, but you can see in the thinner parts of blood, or in the transition here, that it gets some orange tints. Additionally, I find it to be a little bit more obvious in blood bags. Obviously you have the plastic aging, but you also have yellow tinting from the contact with blood, and orange tints in the thinner parts as well. One thing you have to note is that arterial blood and venous blood don't have the same color, partly because of oxygenation. What we mostly see in cinema is venous blood, it's actually deeper red, almost purple. Though because it's so rarely seen, you might get some strange looks if you make a blood shader that's this bright. So I have this scene here with a blood splatter from Megaskin. And usually for blood you would have a little bit of refract and a little bit of diffuse. And it can work in many cases. But I think blood splatters are one of the situations that really highlights the potential of the VFOC technique. So let's get closer a little bit. And I'll just apply my new blood shader. You would just uh, introduce some reflection, reduce the IR. I'm going to kill all diffuse to show you that there's uh, absolutely no diffuse in this shader. I'm going to turn on refraction. And now I'm going to introduce some fog color. So as usual, I'll start with uh, 0.95 and 0.95 into both saturation and value. And this time I'm going to choose a yellow color. Um, usually between 0.5 and 0.8 works, so I'm going to go with 0.6. And now obviously it's uh, way too discreet, so we're going to reduce the depth by a lot, really. It's better, but uh, it's completely unrealistic, so let's not be afraid and go even shorter in terms of depth. This is better, we start to have the blood effect, but it's way too bright and still way too saturated, so I'm going to decrease the depth again. There we go, 0.005 centimeters seems to be working well in this scene. And now if we roam around the scene, we can see the blood shader in all of its glory. And what's really cool about this technique is that as you can see, the thinner strings of blood don't really have the same colors and saturation as some of the bigger spots. Now if I roam around and I start zooming in, we can see the potential of this shader. And there we go. And if we wanted to switch from venous to arterial blood, all we would have to do is increase the depth just a little bit. And now we have blood that's much fresher and much redder. And really this technique works in any scale and any situation. For example here with the blood bag. Or here just another example with a little bit of blood inside a test tube. And really the scale doesn't really matter with this workflow. It works at any scale considering it's just iterations and iterations of absorption. So the look you get on a 10 meter thick object and a depth of 1 meter is the same as a 10 centimeter object and a depth of 1 centimeter. Now you could say blood is actually yellow. Okay, so last but not least, I've prepared this little scene where we can see all the intricacies of the fog and in different situations as well. So this current setup is comparing the luminance of the fog you choose to the depth. Because you know, I kind of find it to be a little bit confusing when you have to choose between the low saturated but concentrated fog and a highly saturated but low concentration fog. And on this example, I'm comparing hue against depth. And I want to point out something here. There are some hues that display no tint shifts at different densities. For example, green, this cyan, and this blue. 
And the reason for that is that the same way adding white adds a little bit of all colors inside our fog. All colors that only have one channel on, don't have any other colors to mix in and variate in. Here, let me take a look at the shader. So the colors I've chosen here are yellow and blue. But if instead I choose a color that's only pure green and only pure blue, then we lose most if not all of the variation potential. And note that there is a little bit of variation here just because for the sanity of the shader, I've added some white. But if I were to set it to pure blue and pure green, then we can see that the pure colors on each side are not working. In the third example, I'm comparing saturation against depth, and we can see that saturation takes over really quick and might go overboard in some shaders at low depth. In those cases, you might want to pay attention to other options and find a softer in between like this one. In this very last example, I'm comparing different hues of the spectrum against depth. And as I've explained before, colors that mix different wavelengths allow for more varied and visible tint variations. This is why magenta has a primary color, cyan, green, and red, don't really have that much variation against say orange or a yellow that's in between pure yellow and green. So this was my first tutorial, I hope that you found it interesting and well explained. Let me know if you have any thought or question in the comments. And on that note, I wish you goodbye.